It's the early 14th century, and Northern Italy is in a continuous state of battles, wars, and feuds that have persisted for several centuries now. The source of most of this discord is divided between the two Italian factions, each supporting rival political claims by the Holy Roman Empire and the Pope. The cities that supported the Pope are called Guefs, or the Church Party, and the cities that supported the Holy Roman Empire are called Ghibellines, or the Imperial Party. If you want to find out more about the complicated political relationship between these two factions, watch my Empire vs the Papacy video. During this politically divided time, the bordering cities of Bologna and Modena, which were natural rivals at the best of times, found themselves at opposing sides, with Bologna being a starch church party supporter and Modena a starch imperial party supporter. This meant that the already existing bad blood between the cities got drastically multiplied by the outside influences of the Pope and the Holy Roman Emperor. Due to all this, the lands of Modena and Bologna became a constant bickering battleground of opposing ideologies. For example, in 1249, after the Battle of Fosalta, in which both Modena and Bologna participated, supporting their respective factions, the victorious Bolognese thought it would be funny to launch a live donkey over the walls of Modena, and so they did, humiliating the Modenese. Continuing from there, in 1296, Bologna managed to capture a few border towns from Modena, and the Pope quickly acknowledged the new holdings as core Bolognese territory. But this wasn't just a one-sided conflict, for example, the leader of a starch pro-empire leaning Mantua, Passerino Bonacolsi, also managed to become the leader of Modena in 1308. He was known as a loyal agent to the Emperor Louis IV himself and actively waged war against the cities of Parma and Reggio, both members of the church faction. He also led a bunch of retaliation raids into Bolognese territory. These militant actions, along with his loyalty to the Emperor, got Passarino excommunicated by the Pope, who promised to grant indulgences befit of a crusader if they harm Passarino or his possessions. Continuing on from there, not much changed for most of the early 14th century, with Modena and Bologna being continuously at each other's throats until 1325, when the feud escalated into an all-out war. It started off in July of that year, with Bolognese troops entering Modenese territory and laying waste to border towns and fields. In retaliation, Passarino used the Mantuan army and entered Bolognese territory, besieging the fortified stronghold of Monteveguio. Monteveguio was a very important Bolognese fortress, because it, along along with Zappolino, protected the city from any direct sieges. This was due to the fact that if any army decided to besiege Bologna, they would be vulnerable to a rear attack directed from these two fortresses. Unfortunately for Passerino, this also meant that Monteveguio was a very well fortified stronghold due to its strategic importance. However, an interesting thing occurred when Passerino besieged the fortress. It turned out that the ruler of Monteveguio was a secret supporter of the imperial party and switched his allegiance when Passerino arrived. Whether Passerino knew about this or not is unknown, but now with Monteveguio in the hands of the Imperial Party, Zappolino was the last remaining fortress on the road to Bologna, and with that the die was cast for the next stage. Passerino didn't push deeper into Bolognese territory because a he didn't have enough soldiers and b he technically wasn't at war with Bologna. Yet. Now it is at this point that most English sources, including Wikipedia, Military History Now, Amusing Planet, Logan Productions, Zephyrus, Exquire, Real Life Lore, and many more will tell you about the amusing way the war started. The story goes that during this tumultuous time, some Modenese soldiers managed to sneak into the center of Bologna. Here they found a well with a bucket, which depending on what source you believe was either a simple empty bucket or was filled with loot from the most recent Bolognese raid and put on display in the center of town. The Modenese soldiers naturally decided to steal this bucket, either as a symbol to humiliate the Bolognese or due to the possible loot that was stored in the bucket. When the Bolognese found out about this, they were humiliated and angry, and asked the Modenese to return the bucket. When Modena refused to return the bucket, Bologna declared war. Now this would be a very entertaining and funny story if it were true. Sadly, it isn't. The best way I can put it is that the idea of a Modenese soldier being able to get into the center of Bologna during this time, whether trying to infiltrate or not, is just as ridiculous as the idea of Bologna having a bucket full of loot on display in the center of the city. The story of a stolen bucket being catalyst for a declaration of a war was most likely a misinterpretation of a 17th century poem about the war. This combined with the fact that that Modenese soldiers did steal a bucket during this war, but that definitely happened at the end of the war, not at the start. 
So the actual reason for the declaration of war by Bologna was a combination of many things, including internal politics, the taking of the Monteveggio by Passerino, the overarching empire versus the papacy factions, and the fact that Bologna knew they were able to raise more men if they declared war right now than Modena was. And so, Bologna declared war. Bologna was able to muster up around 20 to 30,000 infantry and 2,000 to 2,500 cavalry knights. Modena, on the other hand, had to ask for help from other pro-imperial cities since they didn't have a big army. The Modenese were able to muster up around 5 to 8,000 infantry and roughly the same amount of cavalry knights as Bologna. However, even though the Bolognese had a much larger force, the composition of these two armies was quite different. The Bolognese infantry, although much larger, was ill-equipped, inexperienced, and overall had low morale as a large portion of the soldiers were forced into service. The Modenese infantry, on the other hand, was largely composed of trained retinue of the various noblemen from the aforementioned cities. They were highly skilled, experienced, and well equipped. When it comes to the cavalry knights, both sides were roughly on the same footing with experience, equipment, and training. The first move of the war was by the Bolognese, whom divided their army into two. One part of the army was set to besiege Monteveggio, and the second part was ordered to prevent the Modenese army from crossing the Panaro River. At first, the strategy seemed to have proved effective, as the Modenese army was struggling to get around the Bolognese defenses. However, one night, they devised a plan. They faked an attack on the bridge down the stream, which forced the Bolognese to redirect more troops from the mountains. Right after this, the Modenese, under the cover of night, quickly moved most of their army upstream, leaving only small contingencies of soldiers along the bank of the river. Then early dawn on November 15th, the Modenese army appeared at the bank of the Panaro River near Marano, surprising the ill-prepared Bolognese defenders that did not expect to find most of the Modenese army this far up in the mountains. The Bolognese defensive river line quickly shattered, and with the momentum on their side, the Modenese pushed all the way to Sarvale, where they lit signal fires to let the remaining soldiers guarding the riverbank know the main army successfully crossed the river. Once regrouped, the Modenese started to march towards the second most important Bolognese fortress, Zapolino. Bologna couldn't afford to lose Zapolino, especially with Monteveggio in Modenese hands, and so they lifted the siege of Monteveggio and ordered the entire army to regroup at Zapolino. With this order, the site of the deciding battle was set, at the end of the Castelletto Plateau by the foothill of the Zapolino fortress. By the time both armies could see each other, it was already late in the day, and there is no doubt that the soldiers on both sides were quite tired. Usually at this point in most medieval wars, the leaders would signal to build a camp and wait till the next day to engage in a battle. However, Modenese leaders were convinced the only way to defeat the superior Bolognese numbers was to deal a quick, surprising and a decisive blow early in the war. This combined with the Modenese momentum throughout the day and the fact that the Bolognese army was not yet fully organized as more soldiers were still coming in, meant that Modena had to fight here and now if they ever ever hoped to win. At least that's how they saw it. This resulted in the fact that the battle itself started around 3.30 to 4pm, giving only around 2 hours of usable daylight, after which if the Modenese didn't score a decisive victory, they would have to do a long retreat as they were deep in Bolognese territory. Nonetheless, this was a gamble they were willing to make. And so, with the sun behind them, they lined up on the plateau with cavalry behind infantry and started to march to the beat of the drums towards the hastily deployed Bolognese line. As the setting sun glimmered off of the armor of the Bolognese infantry, which was a mass of up to 30,000 men packed tightly between the mountains and the Volgolo stream, it became clear that even though they had the higher ground and superior numbers, they wouldn't be able to use that effectively in such a tight spot. Suddenly, the drums stopped and the Modenese infantry along with the cavalry charged straight into the Bolognese line. However, what the Bolognese didn't notice was that part of the cavalry diverged from the main group crossing the stream and going around a small nearby hill, after which when they crossed the stream again, they suddenly emerged on the rear side of the Bolognese army. The Bolognese were caught by surprise and even though they tried to use their cavalry to stop the rear attack, it was too late. Seeing the enemy cavalry on their rear, many Bolognese soldiers thought they got fully encircled and started to retreat from the battle, breaking the lines and creating a full panic amongst the rest of the troops. 
However, trapped in a valley with the only escape route now being blocked by the enemy cavalry meant that most of the soldiers had to try climbing up the hill to the Zappolino fortress. 2,000 of them didn't make it, with about 500 more dying during the battle itself. The Modenese, on the other hand, suffered only around 500 casualties. The battle lasted less than two hours, and Modena had its decisive victory, with the remaining Bolognese infantry scattering around the countryside and the cavalry being chased back all the way to Bologna. After this victory, the following day, Modena besieged and destroyed several fortifications plus the locks on the Rena River. When the army finally reached the walls of Bologna, they made camp but didn't attempt to siege the city. Instead, they basically threw a three-day-long celebration party and forced the Bolognese to watch. After the three days, and with I imagine a terrible hangover, the Modenese withdrew back to their city, but not before some of the soldiers decided it would be funny to steal a bucket from a well outside of the city walls. Why did they do this? Well, you see, it was symbolic. The Modenese were skilled at making artesian wells, which were wells that used the physics of water to basically work as a quote-unquote fountain, meaning you don't need a bucket to get the water out. Bolognese, however, didn't know how to make these artesian wells, and so they had traditional wells with buckets. So the Modenese soldiers stealing the bucket were basically saying, ha, look at those dumb Bolognese, they can't even get some water without the bucket. According to tradition, the symbolic bucket was kept at the Modenese Cathedral, after which, in modern times, it was replaced by a replica and the original was transferred to the City Hall. Now, it is debated whether even this original bucket in the City Hall is truly the bucket from 1325 or just a very old symbolic replica. As far as I know, there has been no carbon dating done on the bucket, but at the same time, there hasn't been any reliable source that would cast suspicion on the originality of the bucket. So far now, it's probably safe to say that the bucket in the city hall is original. After these events, not much more happened in the war, and a few months later, in 1326, a peace treaty was signed. This peace treaty basically stated that Bologna will pay heavy war reparations to Modena if Modena returned the conquered territory. And so the war ended as it started, with the status quo unchanged. If you want to know more about the Battle of Zappolino and the War of the Bucket and can read Italian, I highly recommend the book The Battle of Zappolino and the Kidnapped Bucket. Sadly, it's only in Italian, but it is most likely the best source on the subject out there. For those who don't follow me on Twitter, I sadly had to skip the April video as I was too busy, but now we should be back on track with one video a month as always. And not to spoil anything, but the June and July videos are going to be big ones, so stick around for history.